Welcome to Late Night Gaming. I'm Poem. I'm with uh, my pals uh, Remedy and uh, Astrotech. And Astrotech is our special guest here. Uh, we're going to be um, continuing with our series right now of the top six decks in Star Wars Unlimited. And um, this deck that we're featuring today is Green Boba. And Astrotech, we are bringing him on here because Astrotech is is the green boba maestro um, he's won multiple um, online tournaments with green boba so he's i would say an expert on this deck so we're going to be able to hear from him we'll learn about um, his his uh, deck building decision making um, his uh, uh, we'll learn about piloting and also explore how to interact with this deck um, in terms of the different matchups. So whether you're trying to pilot this deck into the meta game, or whether you're trying to figure out how to counter this deck, um, definitely tune in for all that information and more. So before we get started with kind of diving into this deck, um, Astrotech, uh, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? So just something off topic or, you know, like uh, what is your favorite Star Wars character and movie? Yeah, sounds good. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, as you said, the intro, uh, I go by Astrotech online. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm based in Minnesota. Um, so right by FFG, big fan of FFG card games. Um you know, as far as Star Wars characters go, I gotta gotta say Yoda. I love I love that little guy. Um, and uh, my favorite movie is probably Rogue One. I like how it kind of breaks the narrative on a lot of the Star Wars movies and how it presents a lot of depth and emotion into something that was just kind of one line that was thrown in in number four. So just uh really nice film i think so sweet and so then what got you into star wars unlimited do you have a gaming background that you'd like to tell us about yeah i've been playing card games for about 25 years uh, i started playing magic when i was a kid uh and you know just kind of chewed through as many card games as i could i played you know pokemon Yu Gi Oh, and and really countless others throughout uh throughout my time growing up uh and uh, including a lot of ffg games played game of thrones played star wars destiny um you know all, all sorts of stuff um but yeah coming from star wars destiny i was excited to see ffg's new take at a at a star wars collectible game and so here we are fresh off the launch and it's going well so far sweet so green boba why did you choose this deck yeah, so generally when I approach a new game, I try and find the thing that feels unfair, um, you know, feels a little bit uh, overpowered. And, and you know, if you look at the stats of a lot of the leaders in the game, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to see that Boba Fett's stats are just, you know, slightly above the other five drops. Uh, and that presents uh, a lot of impact when it comes to a board state. That's seventh health can make a big difference coming down on your five resource turn. Uh, and then in addition to that, its ability is something that's also very powerful in a game that revolves around having and maintaining a strong board presence. Being able to ready resources means that you're getting to deploy more uh, each turn, and that makes it that much easier to get ahead of your opponent. Uh, as far as choosing green goes, I think uh, that all of the colors really have a lot that Boba Fett can benefit from. Uh, green, I think, has a lot of key tools, specifically in the dark side, that really synergize well with what Boba Fett's trying to do. Um, Energy Conversion Lab is, you know, a, a big one, and uh, I think on everyone's radar now as as one of the strongest bases, if not the strongest in the game, and certainly gives you the ability to ensure that your opponent's units are leaving the field. Um, aside from that, Overwhelming Barrage is, uh, you know, true to its name. It can be overwhelming and, and really lock games up when it's played. And then you get the addition of Super Laser Technician as another way on top of resupply to ensure that 
you're already uh, strong for the curve Boba Fett. It's coming down a turn earlier and making it that much harder for your opponent. So you just you you wanted to just bring the heat. You wanted to, you yeah. saw this guy. You're like, I want to build the best possible deck in Star Wars Unlimited that I can. And yeah, you know, green Boba. I think in Remedy, maybe you could chime in here. Where would you stack green Boba in the pantheon of decks? Um, I think with a good pilot, it's definitely probably a deck that has a pretty good chance against most of the field, uh, like just from the get go. Um, so I guess it, it's up there. It's up there on the mountain. Um, I guess it's what other decks aspire to be in that um, it's quite flexible in how you approach your opponent. Um, and you can often, especially with what Astro Techs put together, you can sort of adjust your play style depending on whether you're playing a mirror, whether you're playing an aggressive deck. Um, I, I was curious, Astro Tech, whether going into the league, uh, you know, that particular online tournament, whether you did have considerations for which matchup you wanted to favor in the 50 with the sideboard focus from what it looks like is more on the control side. But I wasn't sure if um, that was you intentionally addressing, trying to address the aggressive um, early game that was predominant at the time prior to release. Yeah, you know, I, I think keying off of what you said there, Boba Fett presents a lot of tools that make the deck highly customizable into what you're expecting to see. Um, you know, and so the list that we're going to talk about today, I tried to maximize what I would consider maybe the minimum effective dose into a lot of different strategies. You know, looking, going into the launch of a game, you're going to run into a lot of uh, different types of decks. You'll have to play against all sorts of aggro decks, whether it's Leia or Sabine or, um, you know, any other uh, brew that someone has put together. Uh, or you'll have to play against, you know, the occasional Palpatine or Vader or, you know, the Krennic or Iden decks that have gotten popular. And so you need to have a plan going into both of those. And I, I think Boba Fett does the best job of being able to split the difference and, and lean either direction that he needs to in order to, uh, you know, push the matchup in your favor. So for that reason, I, I tend to put Boba Fett at the top of the metagame. I think he's you know, the undisputed deck to beat. Uh, and I, I don't think that there's many decks that present the same tool set that Boba Fett has right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, I can kind of jump in there. I think this is the deck. Um, you know, it, it won't win every single tournament, but it is the deck that it's it's kind of the number one, you know. It's the one that we need to, you know, you need to have this on your mind when you're, you know, going to a tournament, how am I going to deal with this guy? Um, so, and you might want to consider playing him if you can get your Vaders and your, <laughs> and your Boba Fett legendaries. Um, yeah. So you played, okay, so you won a couple tournaments online. And yeah. now we here we are in season, technically it's season one of the online tournament, but technically there was two seasons before launch that were, weren't were season one, it was season zero point whatever. So yeah. this list, how has it evolved since then? So are there any differences now than, than in the previous iterations that won those tournaments? Either maybe yes. the main list or the sideboard? Yeah, so going into those tournaments, uh, you have you know, what you would expect to play against most. Um, and so going into the first tournament, uh, Command Sabine wasn't really on people's radars, uh, and it was really just kind of uh, a lot of people were talking about Boba Fett, a lot of people were talking about Luke. Um, there were some murmurs about uh, some Krennic type control decks, um, but again, these tournaments happen before you know the full set was spoiled, and so a lot of times, you know, we we didn't have the full picture to understand what the meta was going to look like. And so it was just playing with what we had and what well, we had Boba Fett. And so, um, you know, I, I brought Boba Fett with the plan of just trying to present a deck that could beat other mid range decks. Um, and the first event was one where 
Uh, I was one of the only people playing Steadfast Battalion with Energy Conversion Lab, uh, and that proved to be a powerful tool in that event. Um, you know, it certainly, I think, caught people off guard. Um, but, you know, once the cat's out of the bag, people can start to play around that. So you have to iterate and, and change your strategy. And so going into the second tournament, my plan was to have uh, a bit of a more late game focused sideboard plan. Uh, and at that time, uh, Aiden and Krennic were ramping up a lot. And Sabine Green was just starting to uh, break out. Uh, and so my my plan was to really focus on winning the Aiden and Krennic matchups, which people had dubbed um, the, the Boba Slayer going into that event. Uh, and so, yeah, my focus was just uh, to create a, a game plan against them that made it so when they push the game long, I'm not at a disadvantage anymore. Um, and, you know, that strategy seemed to pay off for me in that event. Um, but, you know, going into the event now, you have strong decks in, in Sabine Green that's going to be very popular. It's also a good budget option since it doesn't really play legendaries. Uh, you've got uh, Krennic and Aiden, uh, Palpatine. The, the field is a lot more broad. Um, and, you know, everyone, now that they've got their hands on cards, is, is exploring. And there's a much larger population of people playing the game than there was prior to launch. And so with that brings new innovations. And so when you go into something like that, you want to take a step back and, and try not to silo your deck list as much and give yourself the tools to play into a broad audience of deck lists. Okay. So when you when you go to build your 50 is it trying to to I mean we kind of been talking about this but is is it philosophically for you is it trying to to figure out what is the best 50 based on trying to maximize what Boba Fett can can do like maybe cur resource curve wise or you know wanting to have the best Boba turn deploy turn to spend all of your resources um you know just trying to like internal consistency of the deck and trying to like hone in on what it its own power level and trying to do the most with that or is it predominantly about reacting to whatever the meta is at that time and it sounds like maybe it's the second option for you it's like boba's this sort of swiss army knife that can sort of adjust to what the meta is so you're trying to tweak you know, either sideboard or main deck to, to deal with that. But what do you think about those? Which which of yeah, those options so, would you, you know, feels more correct to you? Yeah, I think it's a little of both. You know, I think the tweaking like I was talking about is kind of the step that comes after the core understanding of what the deck's trying to do, understanding that that first part. Um you know, knowing that you're playing for the the turn that you deploy Boba Fett, trying to maximize your ability to uh, use the eight resources that you can generate on that turn. And so you just try and build your deck in a way uh, where you can plug the holes in your play plan from turn to turn in a way that uh, creates or establishes a board presence or allows you, you know, in the case of playing six ramp spells uh, to get Boba Fett down a turn earlier and just be doing something that's better than what all the other decks are doing. Um, and so really, you know, Boba presents the ability to functionally play two turn threes on, on turn three when you get the ramp off on turn two uh, and building the deck to push that advantage as much as possible is you know one of the key ideas when you first approach it and so that's why you see a lot of five drops in the deck you see a lot of three drops in the deck you'll see the ramp spells to get you there um then after you have that core idea those those you know core 30 or 35 cards uh you can start to fill holes um you know you know from a core perspective that that you want to try and have around 12 to 14 uh, early plays that you can play on turn one so that you don't fall behind right away. And so uh, that's where you start to get into a bit of that second piece of figuring out 
what you're likely to play against and finding the two drops and one drops that best fill that hole. And so, you know, when you look at this deck list, you'll see that there's, uh, you know, a one copy of the Viper Droid. And that's just because with the prevalence of aggro decks, I've found that you need more units with three power on the first turn to enable you to interact effectively with the Battlefield Marines and Sabines of the world. And it really can feel like just relying on Greedo in those circumstances isn't really good enough to keep you from getting behind in a life deficit. And so if you're seeing more aggro decks, then you're going to want to lean more towards the types of units that can interact with what they're doing and trade profitably or, um, you know, give you some sort of advantage there. Like maybe you start playing Sentinel units in the three drops just to help keep your life total low enough until you can sort of stabilize the board with Boba Fett and Overwhelming Barrage or Vader. Okay. So I think I actually, we had this idea to like get specific with these matchups. So we've identified yeah. three types of matchups that you might face if you're piloting this deck and how best to actually um, go through and interact with with this deck in order to be successful. So we'll look at um, Sabine, uh, Villain Control, and a Mirror Situation. So okay. let's talk about Sabine first. In that scenario, what's your win condition? How do you actually win the game? Yeah, so against Sabine, I think the name of the game is really uh, board control. Uh, you want to keep Sabine off the board while keeping your life total as high as possible. You know, that's easier said than done. Um, but a lot of times, if you get to the point where, you know, you have one or two units in play and Sabine is playing off the top of your deck, you're in, in a winning board position. And then it doesn't necessarily matter what specific cards you have in play, because you'll be able to just continue to chip away at the things that they play and chip away at their life total until the game inevitably pushes uh, over the finish line. And so you just want to, you know, play in a way where you're trading with their units as profitably as you can. Make sure you're using your resources effectively and keeping your life total as high as possible. Okay. So just on that yeah. note, then... Yeah. I think something that comes up sometimes is on turn one, do you pass so that you play a unit in the same arena as theirs? Is it important that you trade on turn two or you're not as bothered because you've got the ACL to have the follow-up turn? Um, yeah. And, and yeah. Then how do you balance that between ramping and controlling the board? Like, do you still try to ramp into Bobber so you get that... Um, you know two turn three play that you're talking about or do you uh hold it back one turn to try and just make sure you're um as healthy as possible yeah i think what it comes down to is is kind of what the hand you're dealt presents as your strategy um but i've fairly commonly used energy conversion lab on turn one or two just to make sure that i can keep them off of uh, you know, using a fleet lieutenant to get in a bunch of chip damage. The the earlier turns of the game are where they're pushing the most damage because it takes you the longest to catch up. And so, you know, I I tend to not pass um, into them uh, because usually what I'll try and do when it comes to mulliganing is keep a hand that can interact profitably on the ground or in the air, whether it's with a seventh fleet or a consortium star viper in the air or Greedo or, or Boba Fett on the ground. Just something that has three power that I can ECL in on turn two and kind of take back the board state when I have initiative and keep them off of that first swing. So I think you addressed this a little bit, but I'll just make sure we've, you know, we go through this kind of in detail. What specific deck building changes, if any, would you make to your list, either main deck or sideboard, if Sabine became prevalent in the meta, like you were expecting to see a ton of Sabine. Yeah, so one thing I would do right away is I would move the shoot first into the main deck from the sideboard. The shoot firsts are in there for the Sabine matchup in particular. Um, one of the big reasons is you have a lot of two power two drops uh, and you want them to be able to trade into uh, the two drops that Sabine's representing. 
and shoot first is just a really clean, efficient way to do that, especially when combined with Boba's ability to ready a resource. So if you're playing into a lot of Sabine locally, you're going to want to play some shoot first in the main to enable your units to uh, push up to those toughness points that, um, that will end up allowing you to trade profitably into what they're doing. Um, in addition to that, I would consider playing uh, units with Sentinel, possibly cell block guard because of its synergy with Darth Vader uh, or um, the other one, the, the militia, the three, four for three homestead militia. Yeah. Homestead militia. I would probably play one of those um, just as a way to force them to trade into your board as opposed to going face because they're going to try and ignore your board as much as possible early. So the more you can force them to interact with it, the better positioned you're going to be to pivot the game into that board control plan that we talked about. All right. Well, we had this kind of a weird idea to actually try now a mulligan, initial mulligan and initial resource, um, pretending that we are using your list um, and we are the green boba deck and we are going up against a Sabine deck. So I'm going to go ahead and show the viewer here my screen so we've got this uh, mulligan uh, mulligan tool um thought i had the mulligan tool yeah there it is okay so here's our first uh six cards that we just got we got a darth vader a crafty smuggler a viper probe droid a waylay an overwhelming barrage and a resupply are you taking a mulligan astrotech uh i I think there's argument to keep this hand. Um, you have a Viper Probe droid, so you can interact profitably on the ground if they choose to move in that direction. Um, you don't really have the air support you need, but you have the option to go with Waylay in case they uh, want to push in that direction. And so with this hand, I'm probably looking to resource Vader and the Crafty Smuggler. And the plan will be, you know, if I'm going first, I'll just play the Viper Probe Droid and and hope to take initiative if they they go ground. I'll be able to see their hand and plan around whether I need to uh, be using the Waylay at the start of the next turn or whether I have the breathing room to resupply and push for getting Boba Fett out on the same turn that they deploy Sabine. Okay, so if they get cued and try to wing leader their A-Wing or something like that, you'll play the Waylay. But if they just drop like another two or three cost unit you'll try to resupply in order to maximize there something like that yeah yeah so the goal will be to trade the viper probe droid into whatever ground unit they play if that's the route they go otherwise the plan's going to be to to go face for three uh see what they do and then decide whether resupply or waylay makes more sense based on kind of what i draw the following turn and the way the game's shaping up based on what's in their hand all right that was just a fun little um activity there <laughs> let's yeah. move on to uh to villain control all right so uh that's like your krennix your idens and even yeah. like your vader decks um what's your win condition there yeah i think uh your win condition in these matchups is a lot of times going to be hoping that you can finish them off with a uh, fets fire spray a lot of time the way the game shapes up is you can put pressure on them really early uh, especially if you can ramp into Boba Fett and you present a play sequence that is you play the Boba Fett turn where you get to use eight resources, deploy on the board. They have to spend their following turn and that turn dealing with Boba Fett and what you've played. And you can follow it up with Fire Spray, which can usually get in around you know 10 damage, depending on whether they have the, the tools to deal with it. Um, that is a sizable chunk and, and usually around the lethal range by that point. Um, and if you know they happen to get to the point where they can super laser blast and clear the board, that's when you push into the later game and rely on things like Vader or just having all of these shielded units that Boba Fett gets to incidentally play become really strong when your goal is to just do the last few points of chip damage. So your crafty smugglers and seventh fleet defenders are kind of good in the late game because they can kind of like they're hard to kill just to get the last bits of damage potentially. Yeah, they take a lot of 
actions to to remove unless they have you know specifically an event to do the job and you know if they're attacking your unit with two of their units that me that means it's not going to your base and that gives you more time to to find another fire spray find evader find something to uh get yourself over the finish line cool all right so um Again, we had asked this about your Sabine matchup, but would you make any specific deck building changes, maybe moving some of those sideboard cards to the main deck, something like that, if you were expecting a bunch of villain control at a tournament or something along those lines? Yeah, I think I would start by taking the Consortium Star Vipers and, and moving them to the board. They, those tend to be better into aggro, though I do think that there are certain situations, depending on what the control decks are presenting, where having more space units can be really profitable. The Aiden and Chronic decks tend to have pretty weak space in the early game, and so that can tend to be a way to push a lot of damage early on. And so, you know, I think... You can you can really go either way with the consortium Star Viper. Um, if if I knew that I was going to a tournament and half the room was going to be playing uh, some deck that has Super Laser Blast in it, I would probably consider bringing the Emperor's uh, Legion into the main. That has been one of the cards that I've found to be the most effective at dealing with the Super Laser Blast turns, as a lot of times they're hoping to use that to deal with Fett's Fire Spray. And the way the resourcing works out, the Legion uh, will cost two of your eight resources on that turn, allow you to get the Fett's Fire Spray back and redeploy it, and that can be uh, backbreaking for your opponent in that situation. And so I would look to bring something like that into the main. I would probably not bring the Reinforcement Walkers in just because they're very expensive, and you want to make sure to keep your curve of cards that you plan to play somewhat low. Um, I think in game one situations where you are unsure how late the game's going to go, especially since, you know, not all games into Krennic or Aiden will go to the eight resource turn, depending on how it plays out for you. And so I, I've liked Reinforcement Walk sideboard card, but I would look to play Emperor's Legion and maybe move the Star Vipers to the board. Okay. All right, let's do the fun thing. Okay. So we're doing our uh, mulligan here, and we are we drew a traitorous, a Darth Vader, a Fett's fire spray, crafty smuggler, a surprise strike, and a seventh fleet defender against a villain control deck. Are we taking a mulligan? Yeah. So I I tend to like to mulligan the first hand if it doesn't have ramp. I think getting ahead of the curve is pretty important. And the villain control decks don't really pressure you that hard. Uh, and so you can afford to mulligan to a hand that doesn't have a turn two play as long as it has a ramp card. Uh, and so even though this hand presents a lot of uh, really powerful cards and, and, you know, things that we want to see. We've got Vader, we've got Fett's Fire Spray. You know, Traitorous certainly has merit in, in most matchups. And uh, I think it's worth shipping this back because you can have some more powerful starts if you have a Rams card. Okay, let's take a look. Um, Remedy, what, what do you think about that one? Are you happy with this hand? I mean, you've got the two, go the, the two drop, Crafty Smuggler, Shielded. Got a seventh fleet defender shielded. You got a fire spray innovator in hand. Are you, um, are you sure I you're think shipping this one? Said, yeah, I think you do. I think often the villain green matchups, regardless of uh, what the other color is, uh, you often obtain a reasonable advantage if you're able to ramp and your opponent can't. So one of the ways you can obtain a, the advantage is to try and mulligan into, into that and you won't get overly punished if you um, don't see a, a one or two drop to get going. Uh, like Astro Tech said, I think with ECL and the way the deck is built reasonably low-costed, the chance of not having a play is unlikely and the upside is quite significant in that particular matchup. Okay. So let's take a look at what we ended up with. So we took our mulligan and we got a crafty smuggler, a consortium star viper, 
a seasoned shore trooper, su one surprise strike, a Darth Vader, and a no good to me dead. What are you resourcing? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I probably would resource crafty smuggler and no good to me dead here uh, with the plan of you know holding on to the Vader for a little bit as a as a contingency if I don't draw a lot of other late game options. But otherwise, the plan is to play Shore Trooper in the Consortium Star Viper and hope that the Star Viper can pressure the air while the, the Shore Trooper can kind of quell the ground a little bit. And, you know, still banking on drawing uh, a ramp spell if we can, but happy to see a space unit. As I said, that their space control early on can be weak. And so having a, a three power space unit early to start pushing damage is going to be critical to transitioning into a late game where they're at low life. Okay. That brings us to our last matchup, the mirror. How do you win the mirror? What's your win condition? Uh, <laughs> I think that the mirror is certainly challenging and it, and it really rewards uh, going first in a lot of ways. Um, but I think one of the things that is important is being aware of how tight every mirror match is. A lot of times you're going to be racing each other uh, and finding opportunities to clear board state when you can. And so cards like Surprise Strike become invaluable because they let you push extra damage that isn't anticipated. And I've had a lot of mirror matches come down to Surprise Strike uh, on a Fett's Fire Spray uh, or you know, it, it really anything, just being able to push that last chunk of damage. So I, it, when I play the matchup, I try not to sort of surprise strike, as I know that it's going to be a really relevant card when you get to the last few turns of the game. Uh, otherwise, win conditions are things like Steadfast Battalion uh, and hitting your ramp early. Um, being the first one to get Boba Fett out, you know, as, as has been a theme, is... Uh, certainly a great way to put yourself ahead on board. And when combined with Steadfast Battalion and Energy Conversion Lab, it allows you to uh, effectively one-shot the opponent's Boba Fett and really minimize the value that they're getting out of their leader deploy. Uh, if you can find opportunities to take Boba Fett out immediately, that's going to be a really good way to give yourself a strong advantage going into the matchup. Yeah, not every, you know, in the mirror, you know, there's also, you know, like non-green decks, um, the the yellow and the red, you know, we can kind of like clump those yeah. in there as well. And it's like, it seems like this deck has the advantage there because of that ramp. You get the Boba down, you can battalion in to kill their Boba. You can surprise strike to kill their Boba as well um, when you're deployed already. So it seems like, you know, getting that Boba in as soon as possible, uh, maybe your first action on your five resource turn, maybe you're not trying to maximize to get a um, to get a resource generated from your Boba that turn, you're just trying to get him deployed so that you could then interact with their Boba, things like that. Um, uh, definitely uh, seems like what you want to be doing, trying to one-shot their Boba as much as possible. So we've got... Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. So... If you were expecting to see a bunch of Boba mirrors, um, what deck building changes, if any, would you make to your deck? Yeah, so you know, you may see in the sideboard that I have uh, two Cunnings in there. I think Cunning is a really interesting card for the mirror match because, uh, as I said, a lot of times it comes down to that final turn race. And Cunning, a lot of times, even though it costs six in this list, is going to represent you know, somewhere between, um, you know, 8 and 15 damage um, between exhausting two units, buffing your own unit, or bouncing something. It's a really big life total swing on that pivotal turn after you've both played a fire spray. Uh, and I think having more cards that allow you to do that uh, you know, on top of things like Overwhelming Barrage is a really good way to get an edge in the mirror match. And so I would look to bring maybe one or two Cunnings into the main if I was expecting a lot of Boba Fett's. 
as I think that card, you know, is gonna gonna overperform in those matchups. You could play a third steadfast battalion just to give yourself a little more consistency in getting that energy conversion lab play. Uh, though I think you know knowledge is out there, so a lot of players will do their best to play around steadfast battalion with energy conversion lab at this point. Um, Another card I would look to maybe bump up is Traitorous. Traitorous is a very powerful card into Boba Fett, as the deck has a lot of powerful three drops that you can take, uh, whether it's Super Laser Technician, Boba Fett, Seventh Fleet Defender, uh, Consortium Star Viper. They're all just really powerful uh, things that can give you an edge if you are able to Traitorous them. And so those types of things, I think, are uh, really great cards to look to to play in the main deck if you're going to be playing into a lot of Boba Fett. Sweet. All right, well, let's do our, our fun thing again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've got a Boba Fett Disintegrator, a No Good to Me Dead, a Cartel Spacer, another No Good to Me Dead, a Season Shore Trooper, and a third No Good to Me Dead. Are you keeping think, this yeah. hand? <laughs> I think this is a pretty easy mulligan. Um, you okay. know, three no good to me deads is, you know, either a really easy resource decision or um, a good reason to to find something better. And I think it's the latter in this case. You know, as I said, I think it, when you're playing the mirror, you really want to hit the ramp. And so, you know, for similar reasons uh, as to into the Krennic matchup, I think it's worth throwing it back for another shot at getting that ramp. Okay, let's do our mulligan. We've got a Steadfast Battalion, a Cartel Spacer, a Greedo, a Viper Probe Droid, a Super Laser Technician, and a Seasoned Shore Trooper. You found that ramp. What are you resourcing here? Yeah. Um, hmm. I th think there's an argument... Uh, you know, it can it can depend on which version of Boba Fett you're playing against, whether you want to resource the Shore Trooper or Greedo. But I would certainly resource one of the two early plays, being that you know you're not really going to be having room to play them. Um, you know, there there is an argument that you might find a window to get a resource ready to play the Greedo, and so you could possibly do that. Uh, I like having the Steadfast and the Ramp. Um, so I guess I'm leaning at resourcing the spacer and the shore trooper, um, and just looking to play Greedo as Greedo can trade into, uh, most of the ground plays in the mirror, aside from, uh, crafty smuggler. So would um, you, would you play your Greedo over your Viper probe? What would be the rationale there? Uh, yeah, it's it's probably better. It's probably better to play the Viper probe. I uh, I just didn't uh, didn't remember that it was in the oh, hand. Okay, yeah, I, I yeah, didn't yeah. see it. Okay, yeah. so, <laughs> so you play the Viper. Yeah, you play the Viper, and then you might be able to like structure that second uh, that that turn two to like be maybe get the the super laser and the Greedo down or something like that. Might be able to, yeah, to get both. That'd be pretty powerful. Sweet. I think yeah. we're we're almost done here. Let's see where we're at. Um, we had a couple other, um, you know, sort of closing things to just say here. What would we, what would a player do if they were, they just watched, they spent the 40 minutes to watch this video. They, they understand Astrotech, you know, he's won two tournaments with this thing. And I mean, we're talking the best players, the guys that have been grinding, you know, since day one, um, on this game and you have won multiple tournaments with this deck and they want to try it but they do not have vader or boba <laughs> what 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 can they slot in there to to still bring something to their local or you know feel like they're playing the boba green deck without those cards yeah you know i think that there's a lot of good budget options you know vader and boba just have you know the best stats and are, are the best at the effect that they have but there are still other cards that can you know fill that slot well things that come to mind are, are stead militia cell block guard uh there's the four three for three uh what is it uh yellow four three for three which one's that guy oh the, the swoop racer swoop racer yeah i think <laughs> swoop racer has a spot 
Um, having four power is really relevant at hitting that seven toughness when you're playing into other Boba decks. Uh, because when you have a surprise strike, Swoop Racer can trade with Boba, and that's really uh, powerful. And a lot of your things have three attacks, so Swoop Racer plus a three, that's enough to take out a Boba. And so Swoop Racer is a good option as well. And so you've got some choices based on kind of what you're seeing at your local scene. If you're seeing more aggro decks, you want to look towards playing the Sentinels. If you're seeing a lot of Boba Fett, maybe give Swoop Racer a try and, and see how that does for you. Um, as far as replacing Vader, you know, I think Reinforcement uh, Walker is is a, is a fine substitute there. Um, you know, it's one cost more expensive, but it does a pretty good job of stabilizing the board in, in a similar way where you can gain some life. Uh, or you can draw some cards. It, it, it can kind of serve both purposes, uh, even though it's very expensive. Um, you know, if you get to the resource turn where you're playing Vader, you'll probably get to the one where you're on Reinforcement Walker. Uh, another option you could play uh, is the Bounty Hunter Crew. I, I think the Bounty Hunter Crew is a, a pretty underrated card overall. Um, being that Boba Fett has some of the most powerful events in the game, uh, being able to rebuy them is a really powerful uh, late game option that can present some similar value to what you're getting out of Vader. So you're getting the 4-4 ambush to come down and, and help stabilize the board a little bit, and you're also able to rebuy something like Overwhelming Barrage or No Good to Me Dead or Waylay just to kind of help you uh, further stabilize the board, or you can push your advantage with something like bringing back a surprise strike to close out the game with that last bit of lethal. And so those are two budget options that I think uh, would do a pretty good job of, of filling the hole of Vader and Boba if uh, if you are not, not able to get those. Okay. Uh, so Astrotech, I wanted to give you um, an opportunity here um, as we wrap this up. Um, to just share any other points you wanted to make about this deck that we haven't had a chance to talk about. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we didn't really talk about, we talked a lot about Boba's perspective, and, you know, he certainly is, I think, you know, the menace in, in the metagame, um, but there are a lot of cards that are very strong against him. Um, you know, cards like Make an Opening, can be very good at dealing with some of those early plays that are really susceptible with two toughness, like Seventh Fleet Defender, uh, things like that. There's a lot of ways that you can find cards from the first set that line up well into what your opponent is trying to do. Uh, and try and build a strategy that can counter that aspect. Uh, you know, one of the things is is you know they're going to be trying to ramp on turn two. So so how do you stop that? Cards like Regional Governor or Del Mico can keep them off of resupplying, uh, or a super laser tech in the case of Regional Governor. So finding the avenues where you can have counterplay to what the Boba Fett is trying to do is a really great way to combat it. Um, and so, you know, I, I really look forward to seeing what the community can come up with now that it's into the hands of the masses and uh i'm excited to see the tournament results coming up sweet yeah i've got i've got a big finals match coming up uh with the yellow version oh, of this yeah. deck so we'll see how how i fare <laughs> um with that one it's got its own we could we already did a video on that so if you haven't had a chance to check that one out you could uh take a take a watch over on that one and i think we've gotten uh to the finish line so I definitely want to uh, thank my pals Astro and um, Astro Tech and Remedy for joining me here and for um, sharing their perspective on this deck. I think um, hopefully you guys learned something about how best to build and pilot this deck, how best to counter it. And um, again, thank you so much for coming on, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. And we'll go ahead and wrap it there. And if you made it this far, you're my hero. <laughs>